Welcome. And today I am recording the last, the final part of this video series of the Dark Light Rhythm. And, uh, and today I'm going to begin with where we paused last time. This being a woman is a blossoming from a girl to a woman. And I want to start with the blossoming. Yeah. And then we will continue from there on as to coming to the final compass, the final depth, uh, the depth of the womb, and how does the womb influence and get interconnected with this rhythm of the dark light, death, rebirth, rhythm, and the four faces, the eight metamorphic pit stops, and how does a woman in her everyday life, uh, on this compass, with this womb, how does she walk? And how does she meet these different layers of her own life cycle? The shifts in the moon's movement, the movement of the seasons and the movement of uh, the day cycle. So she on earth and as the earth moves around the sun and around its own axis, her own womb is also moving shifting, changing, shedding in the body. So, and that is influencing all because it's the mother gland. It influences all her endocrine system all the way to the pituitary. So there's a link there. So this movement, what is this movement that happens in a body? That's where we are going to go. And we are going to open with the initiation. The, when it all began in your life, the first time you began to ovulate, and to start pleading and the movement towards that. And that's what, as we watch this video, I will invite you to bring it into your awareness and that will support us to go deeper today. From a girl to a woman.
just take a moment and let's continue now. Yeah, this blossoming journey of being a woman. Yes. And so here we are. Uh, I wanted to begin with the very core uh, aspect of this whole journey, the dark light rhythm, the four faces, the rhythm, life and life's rhythm, the rhythm of rest and activity and transition from rest to activity and activity to rest. And we saw how the 24 hour clock is connected to this and how our organ system is connected to this whole movement, this rhythm and the eight metamorphic pit stops on the clock, the four faces on the clock, in the same way we looked at the seasons, the months of the year. So this is a Northern Hemisphere is what you're seeing here. And again, how the seasons are spring, summer, autumn, and winter, and rain is right after summer, yeah, before autumn, that's when the rain, uh, rain comes into picture. And then again, the seasonal eight metamorphic pit stops, the four faces. Here you have the pit stops of the season. Okay. And then we have, we saw the moon and how the moon has an impact. And uh, the, the four faces of the moon on a 29.5 day cycle of the moon, the eight metamorphic pit stops of the moon, the fourth, the eighth, the eleventh, and the fifteenth day of the moon, waxing and waning, are formed the four or uh, eight metamorphic pit stops. And so till here we saw that this is common. This is all species. We are very much in tune with this. This is part of our biology. This is part of our physiology. Uh, mental emotional map as well. This is also very much present with men, not just with women, with men. But uh, the influence is, since it's not so much with the body, yeah. So here the the moon impacts the mental emotional and um, yeah, the the prana and the energy. But the body, which is our um, annamaya kosha, as we call it, the sheath of the body. In a woman, that is also interconnected with this rhythm in a very powerful way. And that's what I want to really show. So here I'm showing the elements, how the elements move. Yeah, the four elements. And then here, yes, we looked at this thing, the head wisdom. So there is there are brains. So our brain is not just in our head. There is a brain in our heart. There is a brain in our gut. Yeah. And in a woman, there is also, yeah, there is a brain in her womb. There is a womb, so that place that I have of the hands there, there's a womb right there. So there is a womb rhythm, there's a womb, because our womb, our mother gland, which is the ovarian gland, is directly influenced by the pituitary. So this mother gland influences all the other glands, the endocrine axis, uh, this uh, the adrenal uh, cortisol axis, everything is very interconnected in the womb's biology. Yeah, our ability to feel love and high, and ability to and our these hormonal movements of moving towards something and away from the something is very much built into our biology of our womb. Yeah, so and the womb, as you can see, gets activated. In, in the maiden year. So here we are looking at the life cycle. When, when you become, when in the maiden years is when this womb gets activated. So maiden, mother, you can look at the year cycles here. Queen, crone, yeah, are the four faces of a, in a woman's life cycle that come. There's a very broad faces. And within each phase, she will also meet these other faces, yeah. While these phases predominant during that eight cycle, the other phases are also available. So the in the in the spring, you know, in the maiden years, the crone aspect is very much present in a girl. Yeah. And the mother starts showing up. They are in dormant, the mother, queen, and crone are dormant. In in the mother phase, the mother starts becoming dormant while the maiden is still there. The queen and crone are dormant. Yeah. 
and similarly in the other. So in the in the when you come to the queen, then the maiden that has not been addressed or received shows up in the queen phase. Then the crone phase, the mother that has not received or has not had her uh, truth mirrored and received shows up in the crone phase. Yeah. So this is about the woman's, and then. We also have the age, yeah. So from 80 to 8, 80 to death, birth to 8 years of age of a woman's life is is on this 3 a.m. clock. It's a it's she's on a metamorphic gateway. So she's not in a phase, she's literally on the gateways. That means that it is it is right at the doorstep of death and rebirth. Yeah, so this phase is extremely delicate, vulnerable, sensitive, and needs to be dealt with care, which will lead us either towards life or towards death. Yeah. So, so even in a zero to eight years of age, a girl's movement can be the foundation that lays can be for death or for life, for destruction of, you know, or creative. Impulse. So this this is very very important, and this sets the tone for not just her life. It sets the tone for her womb. It turns. It sets the tone for the life that is to come through. Her. Yeah. So here I have the peak metamorphic gateways, age gateways in a woman's life. And every woman can start, if you start looking at your life towards these gateways, something starts happening. And this is very closely mapped also with the maturation of the planets. So these are very important transitions, yeah, life cycle. So we saw that. And now we're going into the core, the womb rhythm. And here I have taken a 28-day rhythm of the womb and um, it can go in years so 26 through 35 anything is normal in a girl's in a woman's life and as we age sometimes the luteal phase starts becoming shorter so then the the menstrual cycle also starts becoming shorter and sometimes the follicle phase starts becoming longer as we age then also the menstrual cycle can become longer so these are some things to really know about your menstrual cycle. And that's what your womb rhythm is what we're going to look at. So you can see how the colors I've used to show bleeding is akin to death. Red, nothing. Infertility. And then how fertility slowly starts peaking like spring starts happening. And then summer starts happening. And then autumn and back to death. So one in a woman's womb cycle is the first day of bleeding because bleeding day is something surety that we know we see so we that's how we can measure yeah and women have been doing charting their menstrual cycles for 100,000 years even some of the old cave drawings can still show the earliest moon calendars that women have used in some ways the measuring yeah. So when we say Maya, the word in Hindi Sanskrit comes from the word measure, that which is measurable was her need. And from there it, it got kind of began. So the awakening or coming into conscious awareness was something that happened through the womb rhythm in women. Yeah. And so that's a bleeding phase. Then comes the follicular phase which actually continues, then comes follicular and luteal phase actually begin kind of together. So luteal phase in the first 15 days does a completely different job and the next 15 days it does a completely different job, okay? So here it's a luteal, but it's also the PMS. So here the luteal phase, I'm referring only the luteal phase, the post, the premenstrual phase of bleeding. Yeah. And we are not looking at the pregnancy cycle. So when a woman gets pregnant, just post ovulation, fertilization of the egg happens, she is on a completely different metamorphic gateway. And that is, I call it the ninth metamorphic gateway, which is being taken completely by nature. Yeah. So she is off this rhythm. She's off any rhythm that 
as human we can otherwise experience. It's a very different rhythm that she's taken on. Yeah. So it's it's almost that phase of caterpillar becoming getting the cocoon happening and becoming a butterfly. So that is the rhythm. It's a nature movement. Yeah. And what the job of the society and family is to allow that movement to happen naturally, which we have not done a good job in the last thousands of years. We have taken that away from women through medical um, infiltration is the word I would say in the name of um, health and things like that. We have also kind of infiltrated and manipulated this rhythm and brought a lot of artificiality into it. And that also affects our own body's rhythm of every life that comes. And so this is the menstrual cycle. And here I've also brought this death, rebuild, rebirth, renewal. So in a woman's bleeding cycle is her ability every 28, 30 days to completely shed die and be reborn again. So what can she shed? She can shed all her emotional self, all her emotions. She can let go. She can let go her beliefs, her mind. She can let go the dead cells of her body. Along with this womb, she can really make space to recharge everything. Because through the ovarian mother gland, the entire endocrine system can also be renewed when she makes space for it. Okay, so now I want to begin this movement um, by really, most women do not even know where their womb is located. So as you can see this image, if I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite, if you place your hand right at the tip of your uh, vaginal opening, and your vulva opening, like you see at the very cross intersection of your thighs, then you will be able to see, just like you can see this. You know? And I'm in ovulation right now, so there is a little bulge and this bloating and movement in my stomach because the luteal phase in its second half has begun. Yeah, and right here. So here, where my this place is where my ovaries are and the womb. So the womb is actually very small, pear-shaped organ, really small. And it is very much between, you know, it is located, its location is in the, between the urinary bladder, kidneys, you know, um, not even kidneys. The ovaries may come there. So it's in that stomach, um, intestine. So it's right very close to our urinary bladder. Yeah, and um, so this is, so when you have um, menstrual cramps and things like that, you can keep your hands here in this position and just breathe. Or if you have someone else, they can even place it behind you in the lower back and breathe with you as you do this. This can really help relieve tension in that those parts of the body. And now I want to also show you our uterus. The thing is, what's happened over the years is that women have completely lost um, this awareness around their own uterus. So just this is your uterus. Just take a moment. Look at it. So what we really call vagina is really not vagina. It's actually vulva. Vulva is the lip of the vagina. We really can't see the vagina because it's a canal that is from the mouth of the uterus to the vulva is the canal of the vagina to where the baby is born. So you can imagine this very thin canal which stretches to hold an entire baby. Yeah, And here you can see what are the cervix, it's the neck of the uterus, uh, the canal which opens into the vagina and outside. Then you have the ovaries. You can look at there are two ovaries. Yeah, so this time, I, my ovary, my right ovary released the egg. And how do I know that? I know that because I felt the slight, um, uh, not pain, but discomfort in this side of my thighs and this side, like a, uh, it was just two days ago. So I know that my egg has released this. I know that and it, and the, our ovaries alternate. 
Yeah, and the fallopian tube is what carries the egg towards the uterus, and it's during this that the uterus, the egg fertilizes, yeah? And then it docks on the wall of the uterus once it fertilizes, yeah? And if it doesn't, then it needs to be discarded because as this is happening, as the egg is being released, the uterus is already preparing layers for the baby, yeah? So this is happening every month. This is happening every month like clockwork. Yeah, and you can see endometrium. Endometrium is a living. It's like the walls of your home that protect you. You know, uh, with any storm, any rain, the strength of the walls of your house and the roof, this whole combination, the floor, that's the endometrium for the baby. It really is. And it's also alive. So it feeds the child. It, it really nourishes the child. Yeah, so... Um, so this is your uterus. And then I also want to kind of show this thing. Yeah. Have you seen, have you ever taken a mirror and looked at your, your vulva? Yeah. Your bleeding hole, the lips, the layers of lip, the labia majora, the labia minora, the clitoris, which is at the very tip, yeah, inside. Um, uh, a very fork like it's really not a fork but it's a very but kind of you know um, chromosome like structure is how I see it uh, which is a pleasure point it's a recreation pleasure point five times more pleasure point than a tip of a penis and here you have the P point and then you have the vagina or the vagina's opening is there and many women didn't even know that the P and the vagina are different. Yeah, you'll be surprised. And um, and then you have the hymen. And this is, again, this is the flesh tissue uh, inside with the vagina. And no, when you have your penetration, the hymen does not need to break. Okay? So that does not need to break. The breaking is some tightness, something, you know. So, so it doesn't. Uh, that at all need to break and painful in this. So that means you are really not utilizing into your clitoris and opening the woman. A woman's movement of taking in the penis and the man has to be a process of opening, a beautiful, again, it's a process, process of this entire works blossoming to facilitate. It is the most softest area of a woman's body and if that has to be pushed and penetrated through with pain then something is really not supportive for the woman yeah and so this is something again that for you to know and the anus is right there are excretions so you can see all the digestive everything yeah is right here this is the root chakra here so what is your relationship with your vagina and the vulva? Not just yours, but also of others, other women's. Have you seen your own active alive vagina? Do you know the smells of your vagina as it changes through the different cycles of your womb? How does your vagina shift? Have you noticed that? How is your vagina when you're bleeding? How is it when it's ovulating? What's the temperature of your vulva and vagina? Yeah, And this is the doorway, people. This is the doorway through which we come out. Yeah, we have spent time, our most vulnerable time of our life, we have spent inside this, waiting to be released into this world. So at some point, this was the most safe. This has to be. This needs to be the most safest place for us. And if it is not, the repercussions of this are life lasting and life long. Yeah. It requires a considerable amount of work once you come into the world to switch the pain of this unsafety. Okay. So this is something that I want to share here. And now, you know, when does when do you get initiated? So bring to your memory. Yeah, that time. Before you got your periods, not the day you got your bleeding, that means your womb is already awakened 
14 days ago because you ovulated. Yeah, it's only when you ovulate that you bleed. So if you don't ovulate, you will not bleed. If your egg is not mature and released, there is no bleeding that follows it. So that means at some point that follicular movement happened, you felt something and there's a preparation. It takes sometimes two, three years of preparation of fat building in the body. Yeah, your breasts shifting. These Your breasts are also part of this womb. Yeah, so it sits right at the heart, the brain. Yeah, the heart wisdom is your breast and gut wisdom. And, uh, you know, so something starts happening in a woman's body from being in her, she starts getting drawn outwards into the world. And this happens just after around eight years, nine years, this starts happening. Not the bleeding, but this drawing of being pulled outside. And the separating from there is me and there is the world. The world is separate from me. Yeah, it's it's there is pain here. It's not just oneness, there is separation. This plurality, it's not singularity to plurality starts happening for a girl around this time. And that was the movement towards bleeding. Yeah. So this is when she really needs to receive her no. Yeah. So eight, so eight to 12 during this time is when her womb can start awakening. And she really needs the nearness of crones in her life the elders in her life to support her, whose body she can disappear, dissolve and be held. Yeah? Generally not the mothers. Yeah? And these gateways can be really sensitive for a maiden girl. Dreams, there can be really um, nightmares depending upon the lineage and the system. So the pain trapped in the wombs that across generations also starts making itself known in a woman's, in a girl's life. So this is really a do or die, yeah, survive or thrive kind of gateway for a girl, which really needs to be held with deep, deep care. Pain needs to really have a space here for her. So if she wants to get tattooed or if she wants to get peers during this time, work with her to hold that pain. And is it an avoidance of pain or is it, is it an initiation into pain? Because this is an initiation into pain. Holding pain, it is, bleeding is an initiation into the most painful process of birth, which is which is such decibels of pain that a woman doesn't even have to, can cannot even consciously really hold that pain. The nature will create a do, endorphins and oxytocin release to really take you into a state of trance during that time. Yeah, and it's built into the body that it has to be that way. But there is a pain that a woman needs to kind of hold. So initiation to bleeding is also initiating the girl into holding pain and that pain is all right. You can navigate it. You have been given that kind of strength. So allowing the girl, caring for her, regulating with her so she can move through it. So that means the mother and the other women need to have a relationship with pain. If they have learned to bypass it, suppress it, that's what they mirror for the girl. And that's when the trauma cycle continues. Yeah. yeah. And now I'm going to bring this one, this question I posted even in the earlier video. Again, there is this question. Because this sets your relationship with yourself as a woman and your relationship with other women. How was menstruation seen in your family, country, culture? How was your experience of first blood? When, where, how did she arrive? What happened? How old were you? How did that day look, sense and feel like? Did you already know about it? What emotions did you move through? And who was there for you? Who was there for you? Which elder was there for you? Who could regulate you? Who could support you? Not just emotionally, but also your physiology, your physique, your body. Who supported you in your body? 
And how did that experience shape the relationship? Yeah, because that experience really determines because something that happens in the body when we bleed is not something men can understand. If there is no, of all the experiences that I have had in my life, the experience when I bleed or when that movement happens and, and that ovulation, that's something I just cannot um. There's nothing in the world that is equivalent to that experience. It's a very different experience of walls thinning and really um, the outer and inner thinning. It's something that is so subtle, so subtle. Uh, and it's in the body and it's not in this bliss kind of different kind it's a different experience in the body that opens up which also is connected with pain and pleasure melancholy it's very complex very complex emotionally yeah so these are some of the questions that's why this was the first one of the most crucial rite of passage for a girl in matriarchal cultures, this was like the most pivotal, sacred ceremony of a girl. Even more pivotal and crucial than her mating with a man. That moment did not have so much ceremony as this had the most gathering of the community because it was seen as life for the community. Her, and it was understood that her awakening into the mother mind was the need of not just the woman, but it was connected to the well-being of a family, well-being of the community. Because this was also what sets the stage for the relational movement. Yeah. So anything here, any disruption here emerges as a disruption in the family system in the community system, in the social system, yeah, in the relational system. Yeah, so these are some questions that I would invite you. And then we maybe when, when I host these in-person workshops, you could come and be part of ceremonies. And now take a breath to just connect with the girl in you. How is she sitting with you right now? What is she moving through? So the pre-puberty, the puberty girl and the girl post-puberty. And here we are coming to this thing about I am a changing woman. Our cycles matter. Yeah. So from the day we start to bleed to the day we stop bleeding, every single day of your life is on the menstrual cycle. The only two scenarios in which it is not is if you are pregnant or you are on some artificial cyclic movement, either on the pill or the tea, something which is now artificially simulating any artificial simulation then you are not on the natural cycle and every cycle it is our energy level our sense of self our abilities are shifting through the cycle and we have this opportunity to be reborn to be clear that is why women wear virgins because Maiden is virgin. So the maiden phase is called the virgin phase. So every month, once the bleeding ends, you're back to the virgin. Yeah. So it is. it doesn't unconsciously happen. It needs to be consciously made room for in the womb and for all the other layers to also align with it. Then that happens in all the layers. And each menstrual cycle is an opportunity or deep spiritual growth and personal development. You don't need empowerment. You come with the package built in. Power is built into you. The renewal of power, the rebirth of power, the maturity of this power is built into your womb. 
Now here is something for you to know. Again, we all know that as women, we know how um, this blossoming happens in our body, our hips blossom, there's blossoming in our breasts, and there is blossoming in the thighs, uh, you know, the muscles of this areas. There might be some movement here with the thyroid glands. So there are a lot of changes that are happening in a woman and in in a modern culture, which does not allow us to have a full body. It wants us to have very sharp cut straight lines in our body. These movements really hinder these kind of outside world straight lined bodies really hinder our menstruation and the naturalness around it. This movement of bleeding really supports us to think abstractly, logically, metamorphically, reflectively. Yeah? And it supports a relational building need to develop and maintain mutually supportive relationship with others. You know? And it, the emotional and social issues. So there are so many changes that are happening as the blossoming is happening. Yeah? Hormonal changes. Yeah? The adrenal pituitary glands. All these axes suddenly become alive. Ovaries are your mother gland. You know? And um, how do, how, so the question is, who is supporting a maiden through this? Where can she go and ask all the kinds of questions she has? Because it's a huge, huge structural change in her body. Yeah. Who is asking? Who is answering those questions? Yeah. Who is, instead of just giving her the answer, who is inviting her into her own reflection? Who is regulating emotionally with her? Yeah. These are questions which are these are very powerful influences for a girl into becoming a fully emotionally mature woman, not a man. Okay, and here are some cool facts about menstruation. There are nearly four hundred and fifty thousand eggs in your ovaries right from birth. That is half a million eggs we are born with. And in a lifetime, we only release 400 eggs. I mean, isn't that something? Why do we have half a million eggs? So they are also some sense of strength. Hormonally, there is something there. Yeah. And, and how does this process happen? So we know today that the moon has a very direct impact on our womb. And our womb is connected more with the dark cycle in the sense um, there are many, um, and we know this, you know, these theories, one of the, one of the um, studies, decade-long study that was undertaken and part of research was Judy Grant's work around metaphoric theory, the metaphoric theory and how menstruation was directly connected to creation because all origin myths around the world have something to do with menstruation. And this awakening from this merged existence as all the other life form have into coming into this separating so somewhere the human consciousness moved. And, and why is that apes and all the other primates just before us, when they bleed, they are in estrus. Then all the other mammals, when they, you know, dogs, cats, when they bleed, they are in heat. They mate. But when we meet, bleed, we are infertile. We are on the exact opposite side of fertility. We are in death cycle. And Many this so and today the pituitary it releases the egg or it sends the signal when it detects through the eye enough light in the night 
or in the dark circle, in the dark cycle. So when does when is there light in the dark cycle? In the natural way when it is full moon. Yeah. So somewhere there's some sync happened between the moon's waxing and waning and a woman's womb and this awakening, this consciousness seeing light and dark as separate from it, recognizing there is this is happening here and this is happening there. This kind of mirroring yeah, that started happening through the female womb cycle. Yeah. So in an in, in in many of the old culture, in the absence of artificial light, today we I can't ask you what uh, what is light at night. You will say electricity. We can where there is light, we turn on light. But when we didn't have electricity, we bled. So for a woman, this kind of white light has an effect on us. Yeah. So that's why sometimes when women go into the jungle, you go for a you know a retreat or something like that into the wild, and it's full moon. You might have another ovulation. Your egg might just get your pituitary might take it as a chance. Okay, time to release another egg. Yeah, so there might be another ovulation that can. It's very much possible that it happens. Yeah, or it can trigger the process early. Yeah. So these are some things to know about our interconnections of our womb. And also our ovulation, this release of egg is connected to body fat, it is connected to a pituitary, that means it's a very, it's a higher, this gland is also connected to a sahasrara. Yeah? So there's some conscious awareness also connected to this process. When we are fully aware of it and we make space for it, something else opens up. And our stress levels are very much connected to also this process of the pituitary triggering this process of releasing an egg. And how much egg is blood is lost? It's only an egg cup of blood. So it's very little blood. So if you're profusely bleeding in your bleeding cycle, then there are other things happening. Either the luteal phase is creating extra layers or the clearing in from the previous bleeding has not fully cleared, so there are still remnants, or something has happened. Yeah, so you, this is these are some things that you need to kind of speak with the natural path or OBGYN. So light, stress, what we eat, lifestyle, all these directly influence our menstrual cycle. And also when women come together our body synchronizes and we will start bleeding together. So even if there's a healthy womb, that can influence the womb of other women. Yeah, so these are endorphins and these, you know, so there is a, there's a mirroring of love and connection that also influences our womb. So women's wombs are connected horizontally to all the women in her life on earth, and vertically disconnected to her ancestors, her mother, her grandmother, great grandmother's wombs, and also in some sense, her paternal mother's womb, grandmother's womb, because the ex that comes to her from her father is the ex from her grandmother, yeah? Paternal grandmother. And also to her daughters. So it goes further down to her daughters. Yeah? And, uh, yeah. And a part of it, the sun too, and in the center. So your menstrual cycle has the same rhythm as your own life cycle, the moon earth. So menstrual cycle is your compass. So through it is how you look at everything else. So this is what is always predominant, unless you enter menopause. And then you can use the moon. Then you're on a different cycle clock. Yeah. So here I wanted to kind of share with you how important is this rite of passage ceremony of a girl becoming a woman. And every culture around the world has used different ceremonies to honor this time. And in this particular one, I wanted to share with you the Apache, Apache, the Apache tribe from the United States, um, the Mescalero Apache tribe and their own process their own ceremony, how they, they call it the sunrise ceremony, where the girl starts by running 
away she starts running and she, and she goes through this whole process of dancing the whole night really creating this tolerance in the body then she runs so first she runs a shorter distance and come back to the family then she goes a little bit further and come back to the family and then she runs and runs away from her tribe into her own and in her own movement comes back and all the other kids run with her girls and boys the entire tribe then welcomes her back as a woman. So there are these different initiation rituals. In my own matriarchal lineage, there was a ceremony of the girl sitting. And this is again the ceremony after she has sat, after she has bled and now into the woman. So after her first three, four days of rest and complete sitting in darkness, being taken care of, being really held in that dark space, when she emerges, she is led by women into the river where she is bathed and then she is initiated back into the wearing of this particular garment that she then wears every single day of her life, which is not really like underwear or panty, but it was this thing that tied. It's called the Onnara Mundal. It's a one and a half meter cloth, loin cloth, which is which a girl learned to tie her entire pelvic and hip and vulva and uterus to create protection. And when she wears that, there is a really upward pull that really makes her spine stand up. So it's this whole protection for this womb from down. That's what she's initiated into wearing it. And then she's initiated into how to care for herself. She's initiated into uh, being shy and to have this attraction, be acknowledged and having this attraction for a man. So she's teased. She's really made red with tease, yeah? And uh, allow this feeling of, you know, the orgasmicness in the body. And then when she's brought home, she's worshipped. Yeah, uh, in the east corner of the house, a whole altar is set where she's set, she's worshipped, she is she is actually lamps are lit, the entire family comes and congratulates her, gives her gifts. So it's everyone, uh, you know, the mothers, children, men, women, everyone witnesses this gateway as something that is part of their own existence in time, yeah? So the mother is a very, this is part of her becoming not just a woman, but maybe the possibility of motherhood as well. Yeah. So I wanted to share some aspects of this uh, ritual. And this is this ritual really got uh, attention because she is the great, great, great granddaughter of Geronimo. There's also a movie that's been made. He's one of the very famous native leader who actually fought, um, you know, for his tribe and really try to protect his tribe from being disseminated. So these rituals are, you know, these rituals, they are trying so hard to keep the rituals alive in this shifting modern culture time. So I wanted to kind of share a few of these so you can also start seeing. Um, this is the emergence ritual is what this is. Um, so some parts, I will kind of forward it a little bit here and there. Um, so let's see. Okay. So I'm not getting this. Let me just open this. Okay, there it comes. The ceremony, it tells the story just like in the Christian book of Genesis from the beginning of time. It tells about how the universe was created, how the world was created, and how we came about. And our culture and tradition is extremely important because it helps guide us. My granddaughter that's having her ceremony, she really into our tribal ways. It'll keep her strong the rest of her life. And not only that, but it'll keep the tribe strong.
when I hit puberty, we have this ceremony for the girls that are becoming into womanhood to become young ladies. After the ceremony, it will give me a lot of respect as a young lady. It makes me very proud that I'm representing my tribe. So there's four days. We do everything in four for the four sacred mountains. You go through a baby, to a child, to a teenager, and then to a woman. She's tested kind of through hardships. Four days of hard work. You try to keep as traditional as you can. And you live in a tipi for the 12 days, the four days before, the four main days, and the four days after. Every night you dance, and the fourth night you dance all night. And then while they're dancing outside, you dance in your big tipi, in your home. Your medicine man, after he's done eating with you, he gives you a, an Apache name. Mine was Itsa and Sehut Eat. And it's the lady who you first see. These traditions, they amaze me a lot. Like I learn new things from my grandpa. And the ladies around here, they like it when young women have their feast. Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Good to see you. It took me about three years to prepare for the ceremony, and I'm still preparing. You think you have all of it, but you don't. It's, it's a lot to do, getting the Indian food, buying gifts to pay the people that help, the material. So far I spent like $10,000. And this is something that I want to also share that in India, the, the uh, indigenous, uh, so many of the communities, you know, um, uh, even the poor communities of India, especially in the south they spend a lot of money on the ceremony it's a very coarse ceremony and um, in some ways I feel like their autonomy of all through the oppression and systemic oppression in India especially their autonomy and awareness of why they're doing it has kind of shifted but but everyone enjoys it this is what I've seen how powerful it is their community in the way they the the girls are so the power of that girl the erotic power is very intact it's a systemic oppression is where they lose their chance you know so it's so the, the, these traditions are still there at the very earth culture in india uh you know and they are the systemically oppressed the systemically disadvantaged folks of our country as well uh, 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 you know, um, I want to say that, but their their the honor of that tradition is so visible, especially in South India, and there is no shame attached to it. But I would do it again to keep the tradition going. <laughs> And what you see, the yellow, uh, that's very much part of their, uh, even the Apache, the Navajo culture is pollen. They really dust the girl with pollen. Uh, the yellow that you see of the fresh the flowers and, you know, and um, it's, it's such a beautiful thing that between a traditional basket of all these traditional things, she runs from her teepee in which she was resting for her three, four days of her bleeding. And now she is completing this in her traditional attire and coming back, not just as a woman, but also a keeper of a tradition, her traditional secrets, a traditional. So these are not, these are very anciently passed down sacred secrets. Yeah. Now that I've had my face, I feel like I can become stronger now. You just felt different while you were doing it. Like it felt like you were living a long time ago and you didn't have to worry about all this stuff that's happening in the world right now. When you run on the first day, they bring it in 
and it's showing that you're like come like the kids coming in and on the last day you run out and you try to run as far as you can you can see she doesn't run alone so another girl runs with her. a lot more families are going through the rites of passage than before there's a renewed They're taught to hate themselves in the schools. They uh, would not allow you to speak in Apache and deal with these things in Apache and the churches too. They turn us against one another. As an Indian and on this land, we can see what all must have happened here in our last thousands of years. Yeah. Own tribal members, they say that our ways are wicked. It's worshiping the devil and they don't realize what's happening to them. granddaughter that's having her ceremony, no matter what, uh, she'll never set aside her call for a tradition or allowance for anybody. She's a direct descendant of my grandpa, Geronimo. He had some spiritual powers and he was able to deal with a lot of hardships. Not only is he an icon for the entire native tribes, but also for us Apache. I've been learning these traditional healing practices from my grandma. She's been teaching me a lot about these. She's been teaching me how to use the plants, where they come from, how they work. You can see how the grandmother is passing down the wisdom. So these are not wisdom of what to do or what to not to do. These are wisdom that she's learning from a grandmother is about plants, about the land, about the ways of the land, about the ways of the earth, the ways of the herbs ways of the plants and building this relationship with nature and life around. Well, the women are known as as healers because the men, they used to go off to war and once they come back, some of them would be sick. So the women would have to gather these plants for them to help heal them. So they'll be ready for the next war. And then the dancers danced around me and they blessed me. Julie's my great granddaughter. I'm showing her things like traditional foods and traditional ways how to grow up and be a good lady later on. An Apache woman should know how to care for her family and just pass things down that their grandmothers taught them and their mothers. And here again, you have to notice the language that she said, good lady. And I can tell you that's an English word. It is not the translation of what their native word. So the native word is so different for this transition. It's not a good lady. Yeah, Many of these, just like in India, in our traditional uh, language, some of these words came much later. You know, um, we didn't have like, in, in, if I give you an example in my, my own language, the word nanam means shy. It's like this lasia quality to it. But the same word now also means shame. Yeah? So you wonder this transition from shy to shame in the same word. Yeah. And today they will say, when they say, are you not feeling nanam? Many times they're referring to shame and not shy. So this word has got distorted in the same way this word about good is again a word which really doesn't exist even in the old Indian languages. We don't have a word like that. You know, these words have like when we say um, kalyanam, which has become marriage, but kalyanam actually means auspicious. And in the earlier tradition, this auspicious, this word kalyanam was associated with a girl's first marriage, which was this. First kalyanam was rite of passage of menstruation. It was called tirunda kalyanam or the blossoming marriage. That was the marriage. A girl's marriage, ceremony of blossoming into a woman. That was kalyanam, which again became later a patriarchal marriage to a man. 
And this ceremony got completely hidden and shamed yeah, the rite of passage. So these are things that we really need to start understanding that rituals get pr protected and preserved, but their meanings distort and we need to reconnect back and remember back, reclaim back the old ways of existing. And here when the Apache tribe, they're talking about just in 200 years, they have suffered so much. So imagine if this land has been ruled by people who have come from outside for the last thousands of years. Early it was the Mongols and then the, the Turks, yeah, the, 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 the Persians, the, you know, uh, from there and then the British. So it has, it has moved a lot. So these are some things. So what we see today is extremely distorted. If it has to still exist today, in spite of thousands of years, that we still exist itself means it is extremely distorted. We need to start. That's why this rhythm, when you start tuning into the rhythm and everything on this land is based on this old rhythm, you can start seeing new meanings. You can start seeing. So we go to the source and the source is nature. So I just want to kind of bring that to start seeing these things. Oops. Oh. Heard it all. When we sing and pray, it revives us and renews our strength. You can face any challenges and uh, they don't feel threatened. Some girls have breaks in the middle of the night. They sleep for an hour and then they get back up and keep doing it. But like, I kind of don't want to break. Like I want to keep doing it because the longer you do it, the stronger you get. There's no words to describe how I feel to see her going through it. And I see the whole family pitching in and they're working hard. There's no way to repay them for everything that they do except to take part, continue to take part and all the things that was given to me throughout the years, the only way I can pay it back is pass it on down to my people. Girl dance is all right. That's her initiation and then coming in. that our elders did are very, very powerful. So here I also want to now connect, bring some of our wisdom around the body and this energy because this will all start making sense as I bring it all together. And here we have the human body and uh, movement 
all the movement that is happening in our body, our ability to move our limbs and walk, run, the blood to flow, the breath to move, uh, all the organs to work, this all this machinery is because of air element. Yeah, and in, according to Ayurveda, there are five predominant air movements in the body that keep this whole human functioning happening. Yeah. And, and this is what I want. First is the pranavayu. So this upward rising, you can feel from your lungs, this, this movement, this whole area, right? Chest, lungs, heart. This is the throat. This is the region of the pranavayu. From where it goes everywhere, it carries life force energy. So prana is life force energy. It is connected to our respiration. It's connected to a sensory perfection. It is connected to the heart chakra. Yeah? So sensory perception, not the senses itself, but the sense of our perception of us are. So if your prana is low, then your sensory perceptions get affected. Your ability to fully see, your ability to fully taste, your ability to hear, your ability to... Um, touch, sense, your ability to smell shifts, yeah? So pranavayu is really responsible for that. That is one core crime. Then there is the udhanavayu, which you can see it's right here. It's connected to our entire brain, nervous system, throat to head. So when you get cold, when you get this, there are there's some movements connected to prana and udhanavayu. It is connected to our ability to speech, speak, speech, Senses, yes, yeah, so all our senses are here. Our ear, our eyes, our nose, our mouth, yeah, they're all here, right? So it is connected to directly the senses. This why you directly monitors or is connected to the senses as an influence on the senses. And this is connected to our throat chakra. We should be, yeah, chakra is associated with this. And then there's a samana vayu, which is the which is below the diaphragm. Yeah, the entire movement here, this whole movement inside is connected with all the movements of the kidney, our, all our digestion, metabolism, nourishment, you know, how we process and assimilate. This entire region around the navel, yeah, so it is connected to the Manipura chakra, yeah, so that is connected to the movement of the Samana Vayu. And then we have the Vyanavaya, which is the overarching movement in the body, the energy or the life force that is moving through the body, which allows us to move our muscles, our bones, our joints, yeah, um, uh, circulatory system, the nervous system. Its role is carrying and distribution of things. This is also what is connected to the our aura. Yeah? So this whole Vyanavayu is connected to the Swadhisthana which is our gut. Yes, the Swadhisthana chakra, our gut chakra. So that's why it is a very predominant. So like we know that today, the viscera sends 80% of information to the brain. So it's a very, so the Vyana Vyayu is a very powerful Vyayu. Yeah. And then we have Apana Vyayu. Apana Vyayu, you know, it always kind of People don't put much attention on it, I feel. But this is the most cruel thing, uh, crucial thing for all the other values to fully happen and do their job. The apana vayu has to be thorough in its job because apana vayu takes care of all the deadness in our system. It takes care of this downward movement. So all that, they all create the kind of toxins or whatever they detect. So it is what is really letting out the excretory system. It is putting the excretory, so our birthing system and menstruation system. So this is a downward movement. So from the pelvic is the main seat of the apanavayu. Pelvic to feet is the movement of the apanavayu, the root system. It is connected to our muladhara chakra. This is what is connected to menstruation. So if apanavayu is not moving well, you will have constipation, bloating, um, your ability to rest and sleep that also gets affected. Your more, there's more thamasic inertia. So the muladhara chakra, if it's not working, it affects. It's like the foundation of the building. 
Yeah, so Apana Vayu is really the foundational of the building. Yeah. So I wanted to really show how important is the Apana Vayu. And in excretion, the Apana Vayu just becomes predominant. So as we move into evening time, this Vayu kind of predominates. So we can go to sleep, you know. And in the early morning, again, it gets predominant. So we can eliminate. So, But in birthing and menstruation, it lasts for a longer period of time to release that. So there is a downward. So every time you're going to get simulated into the other pranas dominate, it'll affect your menstruation. Yeah. So like if you go, if you want to excrete, you want to pee, then you can't be running and pee, right? You can't be jogging and peeing. You can't be jogging and excreting. You can't do that action the same way. You can't be cooking and excreting. You can be eating and excreting. I mean, we do all kinds of things today. That's a different thing, but that has, doesn't work. In the same way, when you menstruate, you need to refrain from all those activities so the menstruation can happen, the bleeding can happen, because this is why you can really be predominant and do its job. And when you really make space for that sitting, pelvic resting, you will notice that in two days, you know, Sometimes just in a day, the bleeding happens. Yeah. So these values are very important to understand, to understand menstruation. Yeah. So this is the core aspect. And now I wanted to kind of share a video with you about our bleeding, what happens, you know. Let's enjoy this one. And so there you have this um, the cyclic process. It doesn't end. So there is this movement of feeling great, symmetric, overjoyed, ready to collaborate, work, and then the dip, the shift, right? So let's look at the cycle. Yeah. So here I want to kind of bring the menstruation once again on the four faces of the... Um, so when you bleed, you're actually in inner winter. And uh, it is actually just like resting. Whether you feel tired or painful doesn't matter. We are resting so that we can really tune in and not be in the doing space and let the apanavayu kind of do its job. So we move slowly yeah, during this time. We stay from over-engagement of the mind, over-stimulation of the mind. Yeah? Then we have the pre-ovulation phase. 
which is what slowly you're coming out. So we look at each of these faces now. And then you have the, the same thing, just like the being to doing phase. Then we have the ovulation phase, which is actually the shortest phase. It's not as long as this. The ovulation in the sense when the, once the egg is released, it lasts between 16 hours to 36 hours max. And then the egg begins its process of dissemination, dying, disintegrating. Okay. Yeah. No. So there we have the premenstruation phase, pre-ovulation phase. So the so if you look at it from the pre-ovulation itself, the follicular and the luteal phase starts. The first half of the luteal phase is a little different, and then once the egg is released, the luteal phase takes on the job of really building the endometrium. Uh, yeah, so that's what we are going to now look at this phase. Yeah. So these are, as you can see, these are the transition points. So these three areas of transition that is just before you bleed and just after you complete bleeding and during your ovulation. So the first two phases, just, after, just as you're bleeding, your PMS, and just after you bleed, your immunity is really low because all the hormones are kind of brought down to zero. Yeah, so the estrogen and the progesterone, a lot of immunity is created so that the egg that is released and the egg, the fertilization for all that the body really builds health. And then there is a crash in that. Yeah. So these two areas, you have to be really careful of not catching a cold or fever. So our, our immune system goes low. So really nourish yourself with good food healthy food, avoid um, processed food and all that, especially during these gateways. Avoid too much contact, parties, those kind of events around this time. Uh, take care of yourself. And of course, when you're ovulating, you can your, your immunity can really peak because the body has a need. This egg needs to fertilize and the baby that needs to come needs to survive. So everything is working towards that survive. Yeah. So I'm also showing you the moon here. yeah. And this need not really be because of our artificial light and our lifestyle. We are kind of, we, we need not sink. And I don't even want people to see too much meaning into the sinking. Doesn't matter. Yeah, how you bleed is your compass. And you know that if you're bleeding when you're ovulate, when the moon is in full moon and you're ovulating, you know that there is an extra drive in the brain because of the full moon, to be too active and doing, but you bring that brain back to your blood and say, relax, rest. So in the other time when you're ovulating, you are in the, your mind might be in the death phase. So things can come up in that time, you kind of challenge that and you walk with this body. You allow the estrogen rise and this feeling to kind of guide you. Yeah. So these are some things that you, as you know, you're bleeding and you know where the moon is, where the day, day night clock is, where the seasons are, you can start finding your movement. Yeah, so, but you're bleeding, your womb is your compass. So here you can see the half, right? So when you're bleeding anywhere here, yeah, you can, you might still find more sync between the mind and the womb, mind and the body. Yet in the body, mind, spirit, there you can find a sink when you bleed in this phase. And when you bleed on the other phase, you may feel a little not in sync. And that's okay. That's okay. Just know that. That's not the truth of who you are. That is also, there's a lot of things influencing. So as you see, if you start journaling, if you start tracking, you can start seeing this. Okay. So these two, even here. Even this axis or that axis. Yeah, both are considered as the dark phase. So now let's look at what's actually happening in this whole period cycle. So when you start to bleed, all your hormonal reserves, especially connected to your womb, are now completely on the other side. There is no progesterone, estrogen. All the cycles are low. So it's like the dark moon. When the moon is with the sun, you don't see. It. That's when the dark moon is. Moon is closest to the sun. In the same way here, you're closest to yourself. When all 
the up and rise of hormone is gone. This is your normal self, actually, when you bleed. So even when you pause bleeding, this might be the self you will meet if you don't care for this. So this period, this phase will really show us all the things that we are carrying, our emotional pain, our physical pain, our, you know, it really shows us just the map of, whoa, the drama I carry. You know, it really becomes alive here because there is no hormonal influence anymore. Yeah. And body temperature can also kind of drop a coolness can be there um, so this can be a really comforting space to get to knowing yourself get to really shed those emotional spots allow dreams to happen old griefs to go old memories to pass meet the maiden meet old wounds you know uh, letting go of things that you want to let go so this is actually a very phenomenal phase and this on average, it can be five days, but it can go from three to seven days. And it can, you know, little blood everywhere. If there's profuse bleeding, as I said, you have to go and meet a doctor and see what's going on. And, uh, and in these particular time periods, seasons, moon cycles, Okay, so in so what I said was if any of these phases of 9 p.m. to 3 a.m., these gateways, winter, th this phase, if you're bleeding during this time to really care for yourself, yeah, your bleeding can really accentuate. This energy can accentuate of death, disintegration, dissemination, okay? And then as you slowly end bleeding and you're moving into ovulation, what happens is it's actually you're entering into spring, just like mm -hmm. seasonally from winter to spring. And there is a hormonal surge in the body. Yeah. So what happens during this phase is the pituitary gland, it releases the follicular stimulating hormone and the utilizing hormone. So the follicular stimulating hormone's job is to activate 11 to 12 eggs in the ovaries to start developing and maturing. And the way they do that is just like spring water is released and or a seed sprouts when it becomes, when it, is, when it absorbs moisture, these sacs start bulging and with fluid. Yeah, and that's fluid fill sac. That's what is called the follicular phase. So the FSH hormone really allows them to kind of mature. And whichever uh, follicle matures first becomes a dominant follicle. And that's the follicle which will release the egg. So the job of the luteinizing hormone in this particular half of our follicular cycle is to really uh, trigger the follicle, dominant follicle to release enough estrogen yeah, causing the pituitary to reduce FSH so that no more in we have found the we have found the winner. The winner is here. So everyone else pause. Now this is the one we are going with. Yeah. So we have a winner here. And then the other follicles they get wither away, they get absorbed into the body. And then the luteinizing hormone then causes the ovarian follicle, this dominant ovarian follicle to rupture, burst. It like it's like it gets gets bulged with liquid 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 it pops yeah uh, just like our egg uh, seed pops it bulges 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 and pops and creates roots and shoots to begin its journey here the egg begins its journey of now moving and swimming and going where it needs to go and this egg that is released this when this happens is what triggers the process of ovulation yeah and uh, so this movement can feel like peekaboo time because your emotions are rising. So there's a shyness, there's a sensitivity, there's a vulnerability. And to really care for you, so this, when, to synchronize your planning, your reflections, your release, scrubbing, um, you know, all kinds of, so clarity can happen here, creative expressions, so the new beginnings. So you can look here, just, you know, um, what you eat healthy, um, there's a need for touch and um, holding and longing, making room for that. 
Yes, this happens. It's like the young girl finding her walk. Yeah. So this is women who run with the wolves. So here you meet that girl who begins her run with the wolves. Yeah. And then comes the ovulation phase, which is the shortest phase. Yeah. The short, shortest phase in the body, it can last. And you can know this by a little, there's a rise in temperature. There might be a gentle pain or discomfort in one of the sides of even in the lower back or in the front near the thighs. And you know that mm, this ovary has released the egg. Uh, there is a temperature shift in your vulva. The, the stickiness really shifts. Yeah, the moisture in your vagina shifts. So it has a very sticky egg-like consistency. So women, if you're trying to get pregnant, these are some of the things you can use a thermometer to see the rise in temperature. You can also start checking the stickiness of the, it's like when you do egg syrup and you check the stickiness, you check the stickiness of your ovulation to you know, okay, the egg is ripe. I'm ready maybe to, you know, uh, mate and bring a child or life into this world. And so ovulation happens between 12 to 16 days. Yeah, 12th day of your 12th day of your menstrual cycle through 16th day of your menstrual cycle. There is some window. 12, 13, 14 is the most peak ovulation time. And uh, this egg then travels down the fallopian tubes and it waits in the fallopian tubes yeah, to be fertilized by the sperm. So the sperm has to peers come in, release, and then the sperms have just one destination, is finding the egg. So it's, it's if you really look at it, it is just absolutely unbelievable. Our fascination for games and entertainment, this is happening all the time in our body. So the sperms, millions of sperms are released and they have to find the winner, the winning dominant egg. Yeah, and they find, and even when they all may be cloud around the egg, only one sperm is allowed to enter inside. And this entering inside earlier, we thought that it was because of the sperm, but now we know that the egg also determines at that level, hmm, this is not so uh, strong. This sperm rejected, rejected, rejected. It also thins its wall for a particular sperm to come in. So there is a lot that is happening at that level that we really have no clue what's going on, okay? So, uh, yeah, and once the egg is fertilized by the sperm, then together they travel down the uterus and they dock on the lining of the uterus and this is called implantation, okay? And so he, okay, so this is, we we pause here because here also the luteal phase is happening. That's what I want to go to. And then the remaining, the remaining ovarian follicle then forms something called as, so it bursts, the egg is released and the remaining part, it forms something called as the corpus luteum in the, in, in the body. And this corpus luteum's main job is to really stimulate so the LH is luteinizing hormone is still there. What it now does it, it really triggers the corpus lithium to produce progesterone. So progesterone is one of the most important hormone that is uh, that prepares the uterus for the child. Yeah, so it thickens the uterus, and especially once the baby really, once the fertilized egg really starts developing, the it first five weeks, the progesterone has a very important role to play in the health of the child. Yeah. And um, yeah. So here you have some more information. So the, the, the progesterone first 12 weeks is when the progesterone really is activated. And um, so here, yeah, you can see that, you know, many things happen. The cervical mu mucus shifts and this helps bacteria from getting inside the uterus. So now once the egg is fertilized, there is a whole process in work to protect this egg. Yeah, from all outside invaders. Yeah, and if and around week 12 in the first trimester, first the organ that holds the developing uterus will start to produce enough progesterone for the fetus so the corpus luteum doesn't need to anymore. Then the corpus luteum gets smaller and it starts to break down. So the corpus luteum stays till week 12. Yeah. So these are very important aspects. So 
if you're not in the process of mating, if, you, if you're ovulating, if you're not wanting to have a child, then just be aware of this time to not have, you know, so even if you have sex, to have protection so that you don't get pregnant. But you will find a natural rise because estrogen is raised, progesterone is there. So, you know, there's also testosterone during this time. So there's a lot of activity, uh, energy. It's a great time for community, teamwork, celebration. You will look in the mirror and you'll feel radiating and beautiful and socializing. So there's a lot that happens. So this time, really care for your heart. Emotionally care for your heart because summer, again, like summer in the noontime, your belly and your heart, this area really create safety for yourself during this time. So avoid people with whom you can get triggered. So fire is also really alive. That shine, vibrancy comes from fire. So really caring for that fire. And then, so here are some ways, symptoms of ovulation. You can have sensitive breasts. Body, we also really looked at that. Senses can get heightened. A sense of smell. And smell is connected to the earth element. Yeah. Spotting can happen even during ovulation. You can have spotting. You, your vagina can really, vulva can become really wet. So you might need to kind of change, wash more uh, your vagina or be okay with the smell that comes. Yeah. And, but please, you don't need any other thing to wash and your vagina. Your vagina is actually self-cleaning. But sometimes in summer and extreme heat, it can actually cause rashing and these the moisture there. So just wash it with clear water. Yeah. So there are many things that can happen during this time, as you can see. Yeah. So these most of us as women, we know these things happen. And then if the egg doesn't fertile or doesn't get fertilized, then after 10 days, post 10 days uh, of the dominant cycle leave a dominant follicle and the egg releasing the pituitary gets the signal to halt further release of LHS and then corpus lithium starts to break down estrogen and progesterone levels in the body drop without the progesterone the uterine lining won't go through the changes so uterine uterus enters its shedding so this is kind of really facilitated by this luteal phase and so from the minute egg is released, within 14 days, 14 to 15 days, you will bleed. That is the luteal phase. So 10 to 17 days is considered normal. Average is 14 days. If your luteal phase is shorter than 10 or more than 17, then for, it's difficult to be fertile because shorter means the uterus has not really building the capacity to hold the child. And longer means it is too thick to, for the child to survive inside it. So both these phases can start happening as you menopause or due to hormonal fluctuations, stress in the system, you know, things like that. So these are things to really take care of in your prime uh, pregnant pregnancy years when this is really there to really care. It's just like... Uh, yeah, so during this time, as luteal phase, if there is no ovulation, then of course, if the egg doesn't fertilize, energy drops, all these hormonal shifts start happening, everything is breaking down. So this can also kind of have a lot of movement in the body, having an effect on the emotion. Old trauma can get opened up. Dreams can start um, picking up. Um, this is the time to really do self-care, organizing, cleaning, shedding, align with it to shed things, let go of things, uh, clear cleaning. Can You can kind of uh, don't exhaust yourself, but you can kind of align this with that. And um, dark evening, sitting with warm lights, uh, go to rest early, support melatonin release, because if you have enough melatonin release during this phase, then you're bleeding. Can There's a way that your bleeding can be less painful. Yeah? And then, of course, we already looked at the bleeding. So after this comes our bleeding. Yeah? So this is something to really know. This is like the autumn of your uh, bleeding. And when you're entering bleeding, you are actually entering when there is no of this woman's hormonal is not there. So you really get to meet a deep quiet. And as you come into a normal bleeding cycle. 
without the ex too much pain and two other things happening in body, you will meet this very deep, quiet self. Everything kind of, you know, that shuts down and there's a deep sense of knowing. Intuitive knowing opens up. Something that opens up is very wild. The wild woman really shows up here. If you start really tuning into that, you can birth this wild woman back on earth and bring her footsteps back on earth. Now, here I also want, as we are kind of winding down, I also want to speak a little bit about menstrual taboos. You know, some of the menstrual taboos are um, that female blood is considered dark, impure, dirty, sinful, or a woman is considered dark, dirty, sinful while she's bleeding. Bleeding is a curse. And you can see, and it is a cause of death. So she is cursed during the time you don't look at her. Uh, she does. She cannot touch earth and water because she's going to take her impurity and her death energy and put it to all these other things. She has to sit in one place because she's impure. So everything starts with this dark, dirty, impure, sinful. You take that out and you know that she is in the death energy, rest energy. If that's the thing, then you can see everything shifts. Yeah. If you're in that energy, you can see why water and and upon a vayu, she's in that kind of vayu energy. So anything that shifts that energy, you know, she does not enter temples because temples are sources of prana vayu. It's not the source of a prana vayu, it's a source of prana energy. So you don't want anything to shift the apana vayu. Yeah? So she doesn't touch certain plants, certain books. So you can look at that because she's dirty, she doesn't do it. Or you can say that she's in so much power during this time that whatever she touches gets drawn towards her. Yeah. In some traditions in India, they also say that she doesn't go to the temple because the energy which is kept locked in the center in that particular statue will walk away with her. That's the power of her blood. That's the power of the energy that she carries during that wild time. It's so ancient that the ancientness that's in the center sanctum will walk away with her. And if she is not ready, that can cause something for her to happen. Yeah. So these are some things which are there. So these are to really, um, so all these taboos, when you bring it into the dark light rhythm as a woman, you need to be able to kind of, you can choose where you go and what you make it mean and how you navigate it. Yeah, and also taking the consequences of those navigations. So these are all these different taboos that we have. And then I want to kind of bring this energy here to show where menstruation rise, lies, as we have kind of seen. Yeah? And if you look at this, um, this is the energy of menstruation, correct? So it is in the dark phase, it is in the rest phase, it is in the Shiva self phase. So this is your time for yourself. Yeah. And and so this is so taboo itself, the word taboo. comes from the, it's a Fijian word, you know, it is the earliest white uh, explorer who landed on one of these uh, Polynesian or Fijian islands and they were um, not allowed to sit down and the way they said they were so many rules of, and they made it about purity, but it was not about purity, it was about secret, sacred, forbidden. Certain things, certain gateways, like the, all the red and the blues are sacred, secret, forbidden. Yeah? And the black is fully forbidden. The sacred, secret, forbidden. So that which practices, which really kept the sacred, secret, forbidden and allowed us to navigate through it were called as taboos. Yeah? So it has nothing to do with unclean sin, none of that. Those all came as religion came layered on top of it. Yeah. So this is something to really start understanding. 
Yeah. So here I already spoke to you about that, right? Yeah. These are the sacred, secret, forbidden aspects. Yeah. And what has been missing in the enactment of these taboos? Woman's choice and choosing to decide for herself. Giving her the autonomy to choose and decide what she wants. Give her the wisdom. Give her connection to her body. Give her the, give her the power to explore herself. She knows it's built into her. What has been missing is her ability to say no. We do not want women to say no. We teach girls very early on to say yes. Mm -hmm. To include her opinion, her truth. And to be able to say no to what she is, does not include her truth, what is not, that does not include her opinion, to say no to that. We have taken that choice away from women and girls. We have taken her consent, her permission, her ability to voice her truth. We have forgotten to take her permission. So these are things that have made these taboos feel so resistant. It is not in her own way. It is not, it has not moved with the times. It is not in, we send her to school, we send her all this and then we give a culture which is completely disconnected with these modern ways. So where is the bridge? We have not allowed her to create her own bridge. Yeah? We have not given her honor and sacred celebration. Yeah. And the absence of wise elders, wise crone elders, who, and complete lack of explanation, reasoning, and lack of reverence for her, her blood, her womb, her menstrual blood. So this is what is really missing in the enactment of taboos. Yeah? So the taboos are not the problem. It is we humans and our perception of taboos are the problem. Our disconnect from our own body and rhythms is the problem, yeah? So bring the rhythm back, bring the wisdom back, and bring the ritual back. So now I'm gonna bring it all together for you, okay? This is your clock. You follow this. A woman is invited to follow this. And I know I'm picking a pace a little bit when I'm seeing, I don't want to make another video. So I'm going to continue with this one. So this is the question for you. What phase are you? Like I said, I'm in the ovulation phase, just completing ovulation phase. Yeah. So in a way, I am in my inner summer and I know I haven't eaten anything today and I'm talking. So that's increasing my fire. Yeah. So I have to slow a little bit further just to be present with you. So this is what's happening, what we do in each of these phases. I just want you to take a moment to look at this. These are the energies that you are in right now. If you're in bleeding, that's the energy. If you're in follicle, this is the energy. If you're in ovulation, this is the energy. If you are in luteal, this is the energy. Okay. okay, this is also about rebirthing autonomy, yeah, and rebirthing authority. So we really re to so restore autonomy and authority. In, in luteal, we remember humility and trust, and in follicular, we rebirth commitment and trust again in life and their trust in death. Yeah. And now, how do you walk this map? How do you walk this compass? And this is where I'm going to really uh, guide you with that. So right now, what phase of your life cycle are you in? So I'm in the I'm just entering into my queen phase of my life, which is really about sharing and expressing my autonomy in the world, being my own person, owning myself, bringing my gifts in a very different way than from the mother, visioning, being a visionary. And then, yeah. Okay. So here I'm showing you what does each face mean, mother face.
So in a way, if you look at this, my energy right now, mother phase, queen phase is visionary phase is about the literal phase. You need to shed, let go, be light in this phase. You know? So this is something I'm just going to kind of show it once again. And just to pause here for a moment to see which phase are you going to read. Pause the video, read it. And that energy is going to predominate for those many years, in you, depending on which age you're in. And now, with that, how do you interpret the compass? So the question is, what phase of life are you in? So what we looked at earlier. Yeah, maiden, mother, queen, crown, where are you? Then, what phase of blood are you? So like I said, I'm queen and in ovulation. Yeah, so I am queen and in mother, in the, uh, in the bleeding, in the menstrual cycle, I'm in the mother phase. Yeah. kind of entering into luteal phase. Yeah. So there's more synchronous synchrony because I'm towards the end of my ovulation. And anyway, I'm not going to be mating. So the egg is not going to get fertilized. So the movement is towards the luteal phase. And what phase of the moon am I in? And today is um, Today is the sixth day of uh, waxing moon. Yeah, sixth day of waxing moon. So actually I am in the um, follicular aspect, the inner spring, spring of the moon. I'm in the spring of the moon, almost in the autumn of my bleeding cycle, beginning the autumn of my bleeding cycle, in the autumn of my life and in the winter season, so really post-autumn and now seeing how this combination has an effect today, right now. And if I look at the day clock, so I really need to be more aware of the transition, 3 p.m., that gateway, right? Just So 2 p.m. through uh, autumn phase, like 9 p.m. Is a, is a time for me to really uh, deepen into this autumn energy, really capture it, this autumn energy and make time for that during this time. Yeah. And right now it is uh, going to be um, one o'clock. So I am in the ovulation, uh, summertime. So it is the summer of the day, day summer, right? During the daytime, the doing phase. You can see this, which is, but if you see the predomination right now is the doing to being is predominant. In my life, doing to being is predominant. In my blood, doing to being is just starting. In the moon, I am in the being to doing. So there is that other, yeah, there's a little bit of that excitement that must have made me do this video. And in in the um, season, I'm already in the being phase. The season is in the being phase. The day is still in not in the doing, being, doing to being. It's moving towards that. So I really need to nourish myself. I can know that I haven't eaten much since it's lunchtime. I really need to feed myself that energy. So this is the kind of thing that this is when I wrote this, right? So if you can see here, so when you see uh, winter already has a queen in it. So as I'm more in the domination of queen energy during these seasons, the seasonal time and this bit leading cycles, so I really have to tread consciously mm -hmm. so every morning to make room for this awareness and plan your day based on this based on your womb and the season 
and the moon plan the four phases of the day and how you're going to show up. Yeah, that's how you walk this compass as a woman while you're bleeding. How else can you navigate? So I actually also have, I've created many ways of tracking. Like you can track, I create, I've created this blood journal, then you can see the calendar is there. Then I've created this whole wisdom into a book, which is here, very simple book. It's called the Garbhanutus and Chalan. Then there is a Luni Solar Calendar Diary. Then I also have the uh, matriarchal book here of mine, uh, my first book, which catapulted all this journey. And then I also have more ways for you to connect with the moon and your moon. These are uh, different goddesses, the 15 nityas of the moon, 15 goddesses of the moon and how to connect with them. So I have a whole series of books that I've, I have almost finished creating. So there are various ways as a woman to really start tracking yourself. Yeah. Who are you every day? Where are you every day on this earth? And what are you? And there is a rhythm. And the what is the rhythm? And then comes how are you? That's a very, very important question to know. If you can meet these questions every day and walk in alignment with them, you will start meeting more and more the wild, ancient, primordial energy of nature to come through. Okay. And uh, yeah, so this is key. When you bleed, really make time to tune out. Please, when you bleed, don't be with the uh, social media. Unplug. I tell you, even if a day you can unplug when you bleed, it will support you immensely. Say bye to everybody. Create a space in your room, just cool and warm, which is warm and dark and womb-like. That is all your things. So you really prepare for it. And um, yeah. so these are some of the things. Caring for yourself. And each one of you is going to show up in this very different. And to really allow that difference to show up for you. Yeah. And this is where I want to kind of bring us back. Yeah. You know, this is such a long journey, you know, just like uh, a menstrual cycle is like it goes on and on and on. This whole video creation really required my persistence and being here in spite. So I moved through all the phases in coming here and you there you have the entire series and I hope this supports you in knowing the wisdom. Now how you show up in it, how do you walk it, how do you allow this to really inform you in this crazy, abnormal, rhythm lacking world of doing is completely up to you and we also agree to the consequences of that what it shows up and we make to we make room for ourselves in and on it and as women we i invite you to start becoming more vocal about who you are and with this movement these four brains that you have the head the heart the gut and the womb and let your womb start talking and guiding you. Live from your womb rhythm and you will know and meet such deep contentment, quietness, surrender, not just in life, but also in death. And I invite you to join me now on deeper explorations of these rhythms experiential somatic experience uh, explorations of this rhythm and we will meet there so till then blessed be take good care and if you have any questions please write to she stands tall project 
at gmail.com or you can personally message me, email me at reka.gkurup as in K-U-R-U-P at gmail.com. Visit my website, rekakurup.com and also the shestandstall.com to write to me, to connect with women who are really learning, not just to run with the wolves, but to walk with the earth, to stay rooted with the earth, to align with the earth and her rhythm, and to being earth and living human woman. Blessed be.